What is up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome to another episode of Prototype. This is my solo podcast, and we are kicking off 2024 with an episode that's focused on reviewing how 2023 went overall, as best as I can sum that up in like a 30-minute segment or whatever, uh, while also recapping the final event of that year, the Winter Invitational, where we played Cosmonarchy Brood War, the most ambitious project ever made for StarCraft I. And uh, yeah, we just had a, a nice event of a bunch of players who were not top class in terms of their performance, but they still managed to entertain us as if they were top class. I'll say that much. Of course, we'll also be talking a little bit about uh, future invitationals and, you know, some future plans in general. Otherwise, we have the uh, coffee questions section, where if you are a financial supporter of our work, one of the things that you can do is every time I record one of these episodes, which is roughly four times a month, once a week, you can uh, ask a question and I will answer it in that section. And we actually have a lot of questions this time around, which is always nice to see. So we will be getting to those in, you know, due time. But let's start off, like I mentioned, with 2023's year in review. Uh, this is something that I usually do like to do in general. I like to to pop open sort of like the, maybe like the playlists and, and see like what was I working on back in like, you know, around January or February of like the last year and stuff like that. Uh, and and that, that can be very interesting. Uh, I guess, elucidating because you get to a point where you're like, whoa, I don't remember what all I was working on, uh, you know, back in the day. I don't really remember, you know, I, I did so many streams, right? Like it takes me a while in order to see, even to scroll back to, to find the, the stuff from back in the day, like what was even going on? Uh, so, you know, as we actually hit 2023, as the as that year began, uh, one of the things that we were working on are, uh, you know, campaign content. Uh, we were continuing to adjust the economy. Uh, we were also working on melee maps for what felt like the real first uh, genuine amount of time in a while. We had worked on, I had worked on Megalith Empire in February. Uh, that's a map that some people may remember actually made a reappearance, a reemergence in um the Winter Invitational, funnily enough. Uh, one of the reasons why I wanted to pull that map and some of the other maps from the old days is it precisely because it gave me an opportunity to uh, to check that out and, and to sort of like, as, as a bit of a touchstone, like, hey, I remember this map. I remember where we were when we made this map. So that was definitely one of them. Uh, we worked on the witness mode. We worked on fixing AI spell casting. People may remember that was actually busted at the start of the year where they just refused to cast certain spells and stuff. Um, we worked on a bunch of models, of course. Uh, but this is back when... Oh, yeah, we also yeah made Excelsior, which is like a three-player FFA map or whatever. I don't know how many people are going to be familiar with that. Uh, there's uh, you know things like me working on the Vagrant model, which is like a kit bash of the Ecclesiast, uh, stuff like that. Um, I did some modeling practice back then. I worked on Infinite Loop, which is a 2v2 map that I don't think we saw too much of. I worked on some of the co-op maps in March. That was like the Benefactor and False Idols. Those were for, uh, False Idols was Three Crow, uh, and the Benefactor was Luciferius. So those are like birthday maps, basically. Um, yeah, a bunch, a bunch of AI adjustments and stuff. And, and, you know, so like going into April, we were dealing with a lot of, uh, balancing and overhauls. That was when we were working on things like, um... Essentially, one of the things that I, I remember doing is like the stat crunch and stuff like that. So this is all before any tournaments were played. Remember, the tournaments only started showing up, I think, in June. We'll get to the sort of recap of those in a moment. But yeah, aside from that, it was, um, you know, I think four or five streams, maybe maybe five, six streams actually of, of balances and, and changes. Uh, definitely a lot of models. Uh, worked on things like the Madrigal model and stuff uh, around the uh, mark of May. Yeah, Cataphract and Madrigal I was working on. At some point, I was actually working on the Coras back then as well, but I never quite finished it. Uh, I see the Azigrazint in here is like a kit bash I was doing uh, in some of the thumbnails and stuff. A um, bunch of work on Terran deployments and turrets around this time. Yeah, we, we start hitting like June and stuff. Uh, uh, that was definitely something that was occurring. And then, yeah, okay, so in July, uh, we had done a couple of, yeah, some tournament prep and then... Yeah, I guess that's around the time that things happened. So uh, it's, it was pretty cool to see sort of like the, the evolution of the project where we finished tinkering with the economy, essentially. Uh, and then we uh, finished working on, you know, uh, a bunch of other details as well, like actually trying to make some melee maps and, you know, update the audio visuals and, and models and stuff. Uh, but um, 
yeah, the, the, the economy was definitely a big deal. The stat crunch was a big deal. And then after a certain point, you know, some months later, we felt like, okay, it's a good idea to start getting into the uh, actual uh, tournaments at that point, right? So that kind of made sense as well. Um, now, one of the things that's really interesting, too, is that even though we had the tournaments start to show up around July, uh, and obviously it was like a... I guess you could say it was a... It was like an interesting mm, experiment because there's a lot about it that like we the, the project is still not exactly complete for obvious reasons, right? Like there's certain missing features with the UI customization. A couple of units still haven't been implemented. Uh, graphics, especially, you know, audio visuals are are lacking, right? Uh, a lot of units don't have like new unit responses yet and stuff like that. And then. You know, you, you, you look beyond that and it's like, well, we also don't have that much content. We don't have, uh, you know, campaigns and so like actually the screenshot for this episode is taken from the Zerg tutorial map uh, where you can see here we have uh, uh, the red player being attacked by the uh, brown player. And one of the things that you'll notice here or you may notice is that, of course, we have the lava that is blended with jungle because I added jungle to Ashworld. Uh, so that's pretty cool just to see that in action. But uh, yeah, beyond that, right? Like, you don't really see that much content. Like, there's the co-op missions and stuff. I've been refurbishing the old Hydra maps, but we don't have a lot of missions that actually are like a narrative, you know, like single player, seven map campaign or whatever. Um, so that's something that, like, we were going to be focused on, and then we were busy doing a bunch of work on the actual core game. And then after the core game stuff, we were doing a bunch of work on the uh, element for like wh where you would, uh, well, I guess you would say it's like the, the competitive side. We're doing all these tournaments and stuff. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, we'll, we'll get into it, but I think like the tournaments calming down a little bit and making it so that they're like every other month instead of every month uh, in 2024 makes a lot of sense. Well, as far as like the full spectrum, like let's do the gauntlet into the group stage, into the playoffs. If we, you know, we, we might have like just a couple of, you know, tournaments here and there that are just you know, playoffs this or playoffs that. I mean, a uh, group stage this, group stage that or whatever. And it's, and it's only a group stage event and it's like only one day. Uh, and that might be good. Or maybe it's like two days and it's like the group stage and then like the winners we, we do on Saturday or something. Uh, or like Sunday rather, like the next day, uh, the winners of those. That, that could be an interesting thing. But uh, that, that might be like, you know, we do those once a month or maybe twice a month because we do one for the, the underclass players and then one for the upper class players, right? Um, that, that could be kind of interesting. So, yeah, I don't know. It's definitely something to think about. But uh, anyway, it's interesting to see that that was sort of the arc. is Because, you know, I, I started the year off working on Day of Blood, working on a bunch of campaign-related content, working on tutorials eventually in, like, the month of um, March, and then, like, picking that back up in the month of August. And it's just not been finished. And that's, like, definitely something where I feel like we're lacking a lot of, you know, I was, I was musing on this recently in a stream Fagudo had asked me about uh, some quite. He basically asked me, like, how far away are you from, like, having CMWB complete? And I think, like, okay, graphically speaking, we're definitely not there yet. Like, maybe we're... I don't even think we're 50% there yet because of the lack of graphics for, like, buildings and stuff, right? But, yeah, we can we can deal with the... Gra like, we can kind of leave it jank visually uh, and, and say, like, okay, I, I don't really mind that. That's not, like, mission critical, even though I would love to have new graphics, obviously, and I will work on that. But it's not like top priority. Top priority is like, you know, the iScript extender and finishing some gameplay changes or, or core engine changes, like adding more customization to the hotkeys and stuff and um, UI features, right? Plus uh, implementing some of the remaining units for the existing races, plus implementing the Escozi uh, with the fourth race. Uh, but also, you know, content like campaigns and stuff. I feel like we can make a, an earnest push on that. Uh, one of the reasons why we didn't get around to doing that is that we were busy doing all of this work on tournaments. And that's definitely something that cropped up here. So anyway, I just injecting a little bit of already a little bit of sort of musing and, and retrospective on the uh, stuff that I'm seeing here as I'm scrolling through the tournament list or the, the stream list is uh, definitely something to keep in mind as we get through here. But uh, it was really cool to see the project trans transform from something that was played mostly versus AI, mostly these casual games where the skill levels are all mixed and it doesn't really matter. Uh, if we did play PVP games, you know, it wasn't really that significant. Um, 
and you know like we obviously at this I'm, I'm just looking at the live streams right now but if we go back to the videos you know this is also the year where we started uh casting pvp matches so i think that would have been also february of this year as well so that's uh or this past year so that's crazy i mean this this podcast only started in february of this past year as well so it's not even a year old yet um just to sort of put a, a mark on it like it's it's really surprising actually that things have have taken this long or or whatever i don't know how to describe it exactly it just feels it feels so bizarre to think that we've done so many um like we've done so much work and we've gotten so very far in in general but it's one of those things that's just a little surprising right like you look at it and you're like whoa man that's that's a lot of work uh and also like you maybe like all of this stuff on tournaments and stuff you've like it, it it's almost invisible. It's hard to like tangibly grasp. It's not like content that you can play. It's um, it, it, the, the tournaments are like something that are spectacles for the moment. And then they kind of fade in memory. And, but, the, but they're still there. And the legacy of those tournaments is what influences the game state balancing and stuff. And that's something that I think is very, very useful. So uh, definitely something to keep in mind uh, because I am, I'm just happy that it worked out that way. I'm happy that uh, we were able to get enough interest in some of these um, elements and and get through some of these uh, events, the uh, the the very long ones especially. I have and Mesk was interested enough. Scatu Mesk, he's uh, the guy who does co-casting with me very often. He was interested enough to make it to the majority of those matches, despite his own trying real life circumstances, uh, amongst other things. And then obviously we had a bunch of other people chip in, you know, uh, for all the people who were actually playing, obviously, um, and people trying to spread the word and people trying to get other people interested and, and all this other stuff. So I don't know what the path forward is at this point, because I feel like we've, you know, we, we definitely haven't reached all the people that might be interested in playing in these kinds of tournaments, but we've definitely been like really pushing the angle of working on, hey, we're work you know, we have this mod and it's, you know, interestingly enough, it's competitive, right? It's, it's definitely got some, um, it, it's definitely got some interesting aspects to it where you get to see that and you get to see like, oh shit, you know, this project has like balance updates that are like measured and, and, and thought out and you have all of this other stuff here. And I don't know, it's like interesting to see stuff like that. And like the fact that we have that hype video that I made for Ascension 6 and then I obviously have the, the player intro section on the on Ascension 7 as well. And yeah, yeah, okay. So like we go through that and we think to ourselves like, damn, there's a lot of content for this in terms of videos. But, you know, like what's the grace period? How do you get into things, right? Like how do you actually... How do you pop through and, and actually see that stuff? So that's that's where it comes down to, for me is as I think of that and I think to myself like, damn, there's a uh, I don't know. There's there's something about it where I feel like we absolutely need to we need to we need to keep in mind like there's other people out there that might be interested in this that we can't immediately get uh, reach out to because they might not be interested in the tournament part or maybe they are, but they don't know it yet, you know. Um, and, and like, they're more interested in, okay, what do you have as far as like, you know, new content, maybe a new race. I think the fourth race will actually be a really big thing that people would, could get excited about uh, on the, at the same token, the more we make it different from brood war itself, the, the less likely it is that we can necessarily say, Hey guys, uh, Hey, brood war fans, you know, here it is, check it out. But even beyond that, I feel like there's something to it. I feel like there's something to the idea that you can, you can tell people, hey, we made, we, you know, we're we're sort of reimagining StarCraft in some way. We're adjusting StarCraft. We're changing it a lot, uh, but a lot of it is also still the same thing that you know. And imagine, like, just imagine what it would what it would be like if StarCraft had for a fourth race. Like, you could almost sell Cosmonarchy Brood War to somebody uh, who appreciates StarCraft, a StarCraft One Brood War, you know, that sort of thing, by saying, imagine if Brood War had a hundred had 50 units per race or or, or 100 like 150 units overall or whatever you know like imagine if they if the tech trees in in brood war were just like three, three or four times bigger right uh and imagine if there was no uh there were far few limiting factors on your scale in terms of supply in terms of selection limit uh in terms of stuff like that unit limit right the unit cap itself being raised beyond even what you can do in remastered and stuff like that, right? So 
imagine those things. Just uh, imagine if StarCraft could have higher scale engagements and had much larger scale tech trees. Like, what, what, what would it be like, right? And, and that's sort of like, that's you, you, you prime them to think of it in that f- sort of perspective. Um, but anyway, that's definitely something that I think, like, that's the, the broad strokes. That's sort of like the, the, the thing that I look at now is that, like, okay, we've, we've appealed to people by saying, imagine that, but also we have tournaments and we have, like, a competitive scene and stuff. Um, and, and that's definitely cool, right? Uh, but we need to also be building stuff for people who aren't expressly interested in participating in the competitive stuff. Because we've got an audience for it. We've got people who are interested in watching it. But what about the people who are interested in just the single player stuff or maybe the co-op stuff or something? And they aren't so interested in, you know, playing player versus player. They, they don't have a problem with watching it and they think it's interesting and cool, but it's not going to specifically allow them to appreciate it, right? Uh, and also, you know, I'm thinking about it like, you know, how much longer should we be... The, the question when it comes to Cosmonarchy Brood War that, is, that sort of hits me every time we start a new year is how much longer do we want to be doing this? How much longer do we want to be working on this as opposed to like our own game and stuff, right? And and so our own game is gatekept in a way or uh, I guess like bottlenecked by uh, the Antikythera engine and, you know, the engine layer part of the game basically because we probably won't have... We'll reuse code, surely, between games, but we probably won't have, like, specifically, like, an engine that just launches a game, uh, like, an arbitrary number of games or whatever, because, you know, there's got to be code that's, like, very specific to each game, and it kind of needs to be specific to the game while still being on the engine layer, if that makes sense. So, I don't think it's necessary or sensible or appropriate to basically keep like the engine layer decoupled from the actual game. I don't think that's that's something that Vik and I have talked about and it doesn't really seem that useful uh, as a from a conceptual standpoint or a, pro- a programmatic standpoint. So anyhow, uh, that is something that I wanted to point out, but uh definitely something that like is is in the back of our minds. Like maybe this is the last year we actively develop Cosmonarchy Brood War because once we raise the ice script limit, it won't take me that long to implement a first draft version of the Escozi. Uh, and, you know, maybe we still balance it. Maybe we still engage in stuff like that. But maybe this is the last year where, you know, we work on, on content for it and we work on the, like, we really give it a lot of our attention and time. And, and you know, maybe not. Maybe it takes off this year beyond all expectation. And we, uh, or, or, you know, like we see some other interesting thing that's worth putting in more effort after 2024 ends. It's way too early to tell. But as we get past, you know, the first couple of moments of this year, it is something that is going to continue to be on my mind anyway. And, you know, I'm, I'm also thinking a lot about other things that I might want to do um, that are kind of outside of game design per se. But like I've been talking a lot about um, making video essays or long form video. I think they're literally just referred to as longs, but it's like, you know, the the Mahler crowd or the Little Platoon. Those are, are ga- examples that I go after and um I feel like, you know, stuff like that for gaming doesn't really exist. Uh, and certainly stuff that, because uh, for people who don't know, they mostly do uh, film and TV criticism. Uh, but stuff like that for gaming doesn't really exist. The, the opinions voiced by those people when it comes to video games, if they have any opinions on them at all, are usually pretty normy in that sense. And I have very <laughs> strong heterodox opinions on gaming that I think, um, I'm not sure if they would resonate honestly, but I think it's worth trying to sort of change people's perspectives on that and, you know, demand something better uh, and hopefully like build that expectation. But that's always what I wanted to do anyway in some way is, you know, I knew that uh, the the campaigns that Blizzard made were not very good. And so I started making my own custom campaigns and, you know, like Inconsummate isn't that much better than a Blizzard campaign uh, in my opinion, but, you know, it has long, larger scale. It doesn't achieve it organically, but it has larger scale and it has like, you know, more, more interesting heroes, I guess, even though I think the, the solution to the hero problem is to remove them and stuff like that. So, like, it's a step in the right direction. So, like, even that you can kind of look at and say, like, okay, well, there's some things here that you can kind of see are, are good. But, um, you know, it's not it's not the panacea that we would want, right? Um, and so, anyway, if we, can, if we can deliver my more, I guess, radical ideas... Um, in a way that's like, okay, there's some content you can look at. There's some video, there's some game stuff that you can engage with, with CMBW. Um, Maybe that's like a good padding or background for the video content that I could be making that sort of 
packages these ideas or, or, you know, gives them as an example. Of course, I'd be targeting games that are not RTS games. Like, I would be targeting Baldur's Gate 3, for example, or, you know, I don't know, Mass, like Mass Effect or Dead Space or, like, insert game here that I've played and I have strong opinions on. Especially if those strong opinions seem to be very different than what most people would say. And I, I don't know where to come down on that exactly, but it's definitely something that, uh, to me, uh, feels important to say. And hopefully, anyway, that has uh, made enough sense to people as they are uh, listening to this, uh, because it's just something that I think more people could benefit from um, than just myself. And, you know, if I find that it's good or that it's fun or whatever, uh, that's definitely something that I can I can look back on and I can say, hey, this is a really good idea. Uh, you know, I'm glad that I spent all of this time working on things like, you know, building a better, um, you know, bu building some better argumentation, I guess, in some ways, right? Uh, doing stuff like that. So anyway, that's something to wor that's worth uh, pointing out is that I will probably be engaging in that. Another thing that I should point out here is that the video content, I, I don't know if th those long form videos aren't going to go on the same channel that you're listening to this on. They'd be going on a separate channel. I'd probably brand it completely differently. I had this old YouTube channel called Fraud Emoji, and it was mostly like social commentary videos. It's just, I only made a pair of them, but uh, they're fairly short. Uh, they're kind of funny. You know, it's fairly irreverent, I guess. It's um, Mr. Medicare style humor in some ways, uh, although... I don't have his trademark laugh, so it's not really quite the same thing. And I'm obviously like, it's my first time making those kinds of videos, so it's not very polished. But it's it's funny. Uh, the videos are funny. And um, <laughs> like the fact that it was fraud emoji, and of course I used the frog, uh, that uh, the YouTube, or no, the, the Discord frog emoji uh, as, as it, which is, you know, that's, I don't know if that's great as a, as a logo. Maybe that can be the f fine as a logo as at the start, and then I need to, like, rebrand it with, like, an updated version. When I, you know, if, if the channel gets big enough, to, I, I probably shouldn't be using, like, an... Actually, I don't know what the... If the are the emoji copyrighted? I have no idea. <laughs> but anyway, it would probably be good to, you know, eventually change it. But, you know, frogs. Frogs, frogs, frogs. But uh, that's something that I, I think would be funny to, to do is like take that brand. I probably wouldn't even use the old channel. Uh, not because the content is any in any way objectionable, but because I feel like there's something that YouTube, YouTube favors like if you start off a new channel, I think. I'm honestly not really sure how that works, but I assume that the algorithm is not going to be as kind to somebody uploading a video in, you know, for the first time in like six years or something. I guess I don't remember when I made those videos. I want to say they were like five, six years ago. And so it's like, yeah, going from one th from that to the, the next video in like 2024 is, is a little silly. Uh, so anyway, that's something that you can keep an eye out, though, is, um, you know, whatever I happen to be doing on that. I feel like it'll be a fun time. So I figured I'd sort of name drop that here. And uh, beyond that, though, uh, beyond my personal plans from when it comes to content and stuff, uh, I definitely think, you know, we go back to... Uh, the general streams and not just the modding streams, and we go back to the video content. Actually, as it turns out, we reestablished replay support on the 15th of January of last year. So it was uh, even earlier in the year than I thought, because I, th I said it was February earlier, but that's not true. Uh, our first cast over was actually on the 16th of uh, January. And then we kind of went on from there, where it wasn't daily cast overs, but it was pretty frequent. Uh, that's also January is uh, 14th is when we made the coffee uh, video, uh, the announcement that Veek and I would be accepting donations from people who are interested in checking it out and experiencing it and, and providing, giving back, etc. Uh, I actually have some ideas for coffee perks, I guess you could say. Um, I'll muse a little bit more on those and then talk about them probably in, in the next episode of this show. Uh, but I do want to provide more um, things, like maybe... Uh, I don't know. So there's there's got to be something that I can do uh, than just uh, besides just answering questions that'll make it like more worth people's uh, people's while. But I'll have to think about that. Uh, so that you know, it could be something as simple as like you know, the the person who the people on there who can vote on like what content they want me to focus on or something. And I, I make up a list and then they like basically pick it or something. Sort of like those YouTube polls I used to do, but like just for those guys. Something like that could be interesting anyway. All right, so we talked about the uh, replays, of course. We talked about... Uh, the other thing that we actually did at the very beginning of the year, by the way, is we streamed Apex X, the first voyage, 
I was hoping that I'd be able to do something kind of similar uh, this time around, but uh, for a second voyage. Uh, so I guess we'll we'll keep our sort of uh, hands pressed together and uh, and hope and pray that that something like that can actually happen. Uh, definitely something that I'm interested in doing. Uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, it's just something worth pointing out is that the uh, I I feel like the it's something that's worth trying anyway is uh playing that again i definitely am interested in checking out the new move sets and the new feelings and stuff uh how, how things work uh, but you know we gotta wait for mesk to be ready for it so but that was an interesting thing to kick the year off it was definitely very very new for me uh again we started prototype on the 19th of february we actually got the fraud launcher uh we made a i made a video for the fraud launcher on the uh, 16th of February. That's also when I said I had a green screen and then like put fucking clown calendar behind me or whatever, <laughs> which is pretty funny. Um, uh, yeah. So like just go, sort of going through the list of, of some of the content here. Uh, and that's, that's just what jumps out at you immediately. Uh, there were some playthroughs that we did this year, uh, despite it, it's probably the, the number, the year that I did the least number of playthroughs overall. Uh, but on the 20th of April, uh, because of course it had to be 420, apparently, uh, I did submarine Titans, uh, which of course the video is titled underwater autism. Uh, some of my best work there, honestly. Um, I have no idea uh, about the details of that, but it, it was a good one. Uh, we had the, uh, round table top talk show, uh, we had actually two episodes of that. We were supposed to do a third episode after playing a session uh, that Three Crow was going to run in fifth edition that was going to give me more feelings uh, uh, for that. Uh, but, uh, you know, that that never took off. So we just have those two episodes. We'll see if we, uh, you know, we'll see if I, I, I have any other thoughts and, and uh, any other options and stuff uh, a little bit later on. And indeed, the very first Ascension uh, tournament, the Group A uh, was on, where was that? That was July 1st. Yeah. So just giving you some dates here. Uh, you know, February 19th is, uh, the first episode of prototype and, uh, July 1st is the first episode, uh, first Ascension group and first Ascension group stage, in fact. So, uh, definitely some pretty cool stuff. We had, we had a couple of fraudarchies thrown in here as well. So anyway, going through the, uh, list is definitely filling me with, uh, other ideas. Uh, it's definitely reminding me of all the different details and stuff that had gone down. Uh, we we started the super supercuts actually uh, in this year as well. We started it. I released that on April first. Can you believe it, dude? I think is that the the very first supercut. I think. Oh no, I guess not. It's um, the, the that was the uh, maybe that was the last one for uh, Arcane. No, no, no. Okay, I guess not. Uh, false alarm. But uh, hey, the the supercuts were pretty funny. Uh, and I, I definitely should get back to those. Uh, I did do like a, another one randomly in the middle of the year, but uh, that was definitely something that was pretty interesting. Uh, obviously, I'd been shilling a lot of the. Um, I'd been shilling things like the uh, anchor vid video and stuff like that. Uh, we made the quick targeting video. We made the unit profile for the didact. That was all in June, um, and then yeah, there was all sorts of of different things. We ha we have that funny video that Beaver made called "Bring Me to Bear." Uh, that has over 300 views. So that's how you know the kind of content that people like. Um, yeah, so anyway, like in general, we uh, we managed to, to enjoy ourselves. Obviously doing castovers all the fucking time. And um, making the... Eventually we got to the point where we were doing like... Uh, oh yeah, there's the super cut for Reclamation of Ire that was in the September. Uh, yeah, we, we, we went through a bunch of different things. We uh, We definitely had some interesting shit happen, uh, where we just had like all sorts of, of people, uh, like come in and play the project and provide feedback and stuff. We started work on Pagan, uh, in October of 2023. Uh, that was actually around my birthday. And then I whipped up the, uh, like a demo demonstration video that, that showed the, uh, like the first level, basically like walking through, uh, an experimental level. And then, yeah, what else did we do here? I'm just looking through the the videos and and sort of reminding myself, refreshing my memory. Yeah, we had the uh, the hype video work that we had done, obviously, and the um, the transitions and stuff. That was all in November because that's before Ascension Six. Uh, it was like late October, early November, and 
eventually we had Hapsea start playing and stuff like that. Can you believe it? Uh, but yeah, it was, it was cool shit. It was cool shit. So there's also like certain videos get a lot more views for seemingly no reason. Like the This Game is Epic video, which is the 32nd episode of Prototype, just arbitrarily has almost a thousand views. And I'm not sure why, but that's something that I'll have to try to figure out uh, <laughs> if I'm going to be doing those video essays and stuff and, you know, figure shit out like that. But uh, definitely something to keep in mind anyway. And of course, at the very end of the year, we had to do the Bald Gate playthrough. So uh, you, that makes a lot of sense, right? There was definitely like a couple other playthroughs here, though. There was, uh, I know I played through Five Nations DLC. Yeah, that was on September 6th of this year. So uh, it looks like maybe those are the only two playthroughs, that and uh, Underwater Autism. I, I guess that might have been every, everything. So yeah, that, that's a very starkly small number of, of playthroughs. Uh, for what you would normally expect. So it's interesting to to look back through all that. Uh, we obviously did accomplish a lot. I guess some, some takeaways as we sort of close out this topic. But the year in review for me is always like a nice reminder of all the things that we got up to. It's a nice reminder of the progress because you can go back and look at like videos and castovers and stuff. Um, well, you, this is the year that castover started. But beyond that, you can look at like the game state. You can look at the assets. You can look at the... Like, the, there's certain details about the game back then, about CMBW, that are just very different. I think you can also look at the old episodes of Prototype. And, you know, I, I've done a lot of podcasts now, so I don't know if there's been a lot of immediate growth in that respect. But I feel like generally I'm a bit more cogent, you know, I'm a bit better spoken. And that's all better for the effort of doing all of these episodes of the podcast and doing all the talking that I do in general. And so, you know, I did all this casting and all this conversational stuff, and um, it feels like it's good because I'm able to actuate so many different skills and disciplines that I have from all sorts of different past histories. Like I casted League of Legends and C uh, uh, CSGO and stuff like that. And so that gave me these de these sort of lessons and details and et cetera that I otherwise might not have, right? And so... That's like th th that's one case where it's like there's not really any op option by default for me to be able to leverage that sort of uh, lesson. Uh, and then, OK, we have the cast overs and that kind of does it. And then we have tournaments and that, that really does it, because when I'm casting CSGO, it's like, you know, tier two, tier three tournaments and stuff uh, in the space. And, you know, you're talking about like. I don't know, like I casted a lot of. Um, uh, like uh, one win and stuff like that, like that nine pandas, that sort of uh, avenue. Anybody who knows CSGO uh, might be familiar with those names. And like one win actually has like a major winner on it in Boomich or had, I should say, before you joined Cloud9. Anyway, so like I've casted all of these teams and stuff that are like on the precipice of breaking into like the higher tier uh, or, or whatever. And, you know, a lot of Aurora, um, for example. And, and so it, it was interesting to sort of go through that. And then check that out and, like, try to, uh, you know, like, anyway, the, the, I guess the point I'm trying to make is that, like, you go through that and you think to yourself, like, okay, I'm not really going to be able to use this in the context of, like, a, a StarCraft mod. But no, actually, I can't because now I kind of know, like, what, how much gravitas to bring to, like, a particular match. Is it, like, a match where neither of the teams are, are slated to really uh, do much damage in the event, but one of them is going home? Well, okay, I can bring some gravitas for the guy who's going home. But if it's like a match where nobody can go home yet, but it's like two teams that are not going to be tournament contenders, then I can just kind of have some fun, you know, because it's not really that big of a deal. Um, and so, you know, th that's kind of stuff that's really ne interesting is that I can like bring that to the, the Ascension casts. And then I obviously have like a lot of history thinking about the formats and stuff. And that helped me figure out what kind of formats we might want for our CMBW tournaments. And then... I also have the opportunity to engage with a lot of people from that perspective that like I can be sort of a tournament operator, right? Um, as well as the caster because I have like all of these different weird, like you wouldn't think of them as like complementary skill sets or, you know, for, for the use case that we're talking about, but somehow I can ma manage to put them to use, right? And I have a little bit of video editing know-how, and I have obviously, like, spoken word know-how and script writing know-how, and that gives me the opportunity to do stuff like the hype videos. And that's also, like, a separate thing, right? Um, and then, you know, that's all not to speak of the game design itself, right? Uh, you wear so many damn hats doing this kind of stuff, 
And it's cool to be able to actually, like, for all of those hats to actually be useful. Like, for all of those roles, you can, you still have, you have the skills for it. Like, you have the skills to actually do all of that stuff. You have the uh, background knowledge and, and, and stuff necessary to do at least an okay job at, at all of those things. Uh, so it, it feels like it ends up being very complimentary at the end of the day. And that's really cool. I like that. So um, I guess 2023, in, in, in uh, a takeaway from it, is that it was a year that I was able to further utilize all of my skills to make, you know, talk show slash podcast stuff in prototype, uh, to make, uh, obviously casting in the castovers and in the Ascension tournaments, uh, to make like video editing and to make, um, all that other stuff. Like it was just a year where like so many different things were used. So many different skills that, that had been leveraged in the past were put to work. And I think the, the, the project is better for it. I think I'm better for it. And so I'm happy about that. As we head into 2024, I don't know if there's more skills yet that will be leveraged in that sense, but it's definitely something that I am interested in checking out um, nonetheless. So hopefully uh, that is something that uh, you guys can can feel at the end of the day when you're looking at the content and you're experiencing the stuff. Hopefully it feels like there's been a lot of growth. If you can even remember, if you were even around back when we had like, you know, less stuff, um, so it, it, a lot of people, you know, they just joined and this is their first year with us and they're not like super blooded in that sense where they don't have a big history with the, the No Frauds Club and with us in general. Uh, but I feel like 2024 uh, is going to be really exciting regardless of whether or not you've been here for a while. And for those who have been here for a while, you guys probably remember things like Project Hydra back when it was like two or three new units and we still had upgrades and supply and all this other stuff. And it was just like, oh, I just I just only want to make like a campaign as opposed to, you know, worrying about like a, a total revamp and stuff. And, um, you know, to see how far we've come from that era, from even like the Nemesis Stormborn era and stuff like that. Like, yeah, dude, that's crazy. It's crazy to see that. So anyway, hopefully that was an interesting and cathartic year in review. Uh, maybe you guys thought about, you know, where you were at in your lives when I was th thinking about like, yeah, in February we started replay or we started a prototype. And then in January we started replays and all this other stuff. Maybe you can remember some details based on that. Obviously the very first cast over to ever happen was between the Shambler and Three Crow. So that's really funny. Uh, they were both Terran. They both built a lot of uh, Cyprians <laughs> and, and Wraiths and stuff like that. And so uh, shocking stuff, man, shocking stuff. But hey, Nonetheless, that is a, an interesting sort of trip down memory lane. I think we're ready to recap the Winter Invitational and talk about our future Invitationals. Uh, I did mention a little bit in the in the year in review what uh, some details in there, but we can like sort of segue it into its own section, sort of sideline it. And then, of course, we can do coffee questions because we're probably going to need a little bit of time to get through all the ones we have this time around. And then we will be uh, out of here. So the Winter Inv Invitational had some very exciting games, and we actually had three out of four groups require somebody to sub in, which was really funny. The people who subbed in uh, were, so Benza subbed out in group A and was replaced by My Name is Lul, uh, to everybody's cheering and, and, and favor. It was a very silly, very funny matches. They were very quick and one-sided for the most part, but uh, he actually could have won his first game. He just needed to send his units to the enemy base and he would have basically won at that point. So <laughs> that would have been really funny. Um, uh, but anyway, uh, we had group B. Group B had uh, Sipiak. He was too sick to play, so he uh, was replaced by Scholar, uh, Nicholas, Mr. Nicholas, uh, who XD'd his way. And he played most of his games, but he did have an internet slash computer explosion uh, and then died. So... Uh, yeah, okay, that was it, GG. Uh, but hey, that was pretty funny. And then uh, Group C went just as we ex would have expected. You know, nobody needed to sub out or anything. And then Group D, we had Group D show up. And in Group D, we had, uh, who needed to be replaced? Oh, it was Keen. Uh, Keen was like, oh, I forgot about this and can't play, LOL. <laughs> so we had, uh, we actually had three people who were interested in playing. Newt was drunk. Um, Lundier was, I guess, home from work. And Solstice was also around. And so all three of them responded to my ping, but like I had pinged them and then like we waited a little bit and then 
you know, people didn't respond. Um, and then I think somebody else and then eventually like they all replied. And so it was really funny. Uh, but then I just had them all pick a number between one and a hundred and then I rolled and Solstice got the roll. So he played, uh, and it was, and then he got six pulled immediately because Lucid Furious was six pulling everybody. Uh, but some interesting games anyway, some very funny games. Of course, we had the return of Mame Street legendary map by DF and, uh, DF was in the chat and he was like, it was really cool to see people actually using parts of the map. And, all I could think of was, bro, it's fucking Mame Street. Did you expect? <laughs> did you expect people to actually play it seriously? Like the map, just trying to navigate it is insane. Figuring out where how to expand somewhere is just impossible. Like, how do you even get to a point where you can have a stable game on that map? It's like impossible. But it was funny. It was just funny to me that he's like, oh, finally, I see people they're using the rest of the map. <laughs> I was like, yeah, because they couldn't end the game immediately. So this is uh, where they decided to go. But yeah, it's, it's a funny map. It's a legendary map. People are very, very happy with Meme Street, I think. <laughs> At least the class ones are very happy that they didn't have to play on it. I guess I can put it to that. But uh, actually, DF said that he was going to think about making it, uh, uh, updating it to be a more standard map, which I guess means we'll have to keep the uh, current version and call it Meme Street. Uh, in case we we need that. Uh, but I, I don't think so. I think once it's updated, we'll just use the updated version. Uh, but looking forward to seeing what happens with it anyway. Um, what else did we have, though? We had, yeah, we had My Name is Lull pulling all of his workers to fight one scribe. Uh, that, was a, that was a legendary moment. Uh, we obviously had, like, uh, we, the fact that Balathal won his group was a little surprising, but I didn't think it was out of the question. Uh, and uh, Dead and Fest said he got unlucky with the rolls a couple of times with the random, and he didn't uh, really know how to fight zealots with Zerg, um, and so it, it was definitely a difficult task for him to try to win that group. Uh, we go over to group B, and with uh, Sipiak being replaced by Scholar, I thought, okay, Scholar's a pretty good player. Like, he can handle this. He can do things. Uh, but Three Crow found a way to cheese him by uh, doing a, I think it was literally like a six gate. Like, he, he cut everything. Uh, and, and just made a gateway as fast as possible, and then waypointed a Drakadin into his base, and then microed him to death with a couple of Drakadins and stuff. So uh, that was on Fata Morgana, and he called that. I call that. He he said he, after he won that game, he just goes, "I call that Fata Cheese," and everybody groaned. And if you groaned at me saying that, well, that that's deserved. But don't direct your hatred at me. I didn't say it originally. Uh, so yeah, there was definitely some antics there. Um, it was cool that uh, Scholar was able to play. You know, we don't see him enough. Uh, shout out Heltrix for also being in that group and giving him a shot. There's definitely a number of times where Heltrix was tickling Three Crow with, like, Harakens, and Scholar kept fucking pinging where the Harakens were, and it's like, bro, stop pinging the map. They can see your pings. And he couldn't understand English, so too bad. Uh, but uh, besides that, uh, we had, group, obviously, Group C, Mask versus DF versus the Beaver. Um, I felt like the beaver could have done pretty well in some of those games. He did defeat DF in one of the games with mech, which is pretty interesting because we haven't really seen mech go off, uh, in a while and versus anybody really any race. Uh, but I, I felt like he could have won versus mesk a few times. I was really surprised for mesk to start off by going, he, he went five Oh, uh, like up five and Oh, and then he lost to DF, uh, to deny himself the six Oh, but eventually he, he came back. Uh, and and conquered the group six to one. I'm pretty sure with the final results and stuff. So it was interesting anyway to see that. Um, it's cool to see him go for it, and uh, nice to see him win his group. You know, he he kept saying, "Oh, I'm I'm terrible. I'm a class sixty nine instead of a class two. Uh, and I kept telling him like. In order to be sorted into class three, you have to actually lose your most of your games versus class twos, and you don't do that. So <laughs> that's not happening. Um, so there was definitely that. Uh, when we go into group D, of course, Keen not being able to make it is uh, a little unfortunate because, you know, it's Keen, bro. Like, he's cool. But uh, he wasn't able to make it, so instead we had Solstice step in. Solstice was able to hold his own eventually as he figured things out. Uh, he was able to uh, fight back and defeat Concealed Organic, who was a goofball random player, uh, who actually, I think, in a few areas did better than I thought. He could have beaten Lu uh, Luciferius on um, Pal uh, not Palindrome. Why can't I never remember this map name? Because I want to say Penumbra, but that's a unit. And it's not that. It's Pendulum. That's why I want to say Penumbra, because it starts with Pen. Um, anyway, Pendulum, yeah. He, he could have beaten Luciferius on that map, uh, but it, it was not quite decisive enough. Uh, there's like a couple of key moments where he was a little uh, slow to, to do stuff. But uh, I, I'd love to see him give it another shot at some point. You know, maybe he'll sign up for the, the next one as well. 
uh, but I appreciated him participating uh, for sure. And then, yeah, Solstice coming in as the mercenary who won the uh, the lottery, and uh, he winds up and, and smashes a, Lucy a couple times, smashes uh, Concealed Organic a couple times, and then we go to Main Street for the tiebreaker decider to figure out who's actually going to be the top of the group. And uh, Lucy clutches it out eventually. Crazy stuff. So all in all, it was really cool to see, you know, some lower tier gameplay basically, but also like the, like, I think the map pool being silly helped with it. I feel like we should definitely do that more often where we, you, we use the winter invitational as like an excuse to try new maps. Like, uh, the Shambler's Cossetus seems like a map that should be tried in like the next invitational that we have. That's like the underclass. Um, or maybe it could be like something, maybe we even do it for the the serious, like the class one tournaments, but I'm not sure. I think maybe the class one tournaments will have a prize pool, even if it's a small one, uh, where it's like maybe each group winner takes home like, you know, 10 bucks and each second placer takes home five bucks. And then, you know, it's not much, but it's something, um, that would, that would mean that we are, uh, what each tournament is $60, right? Cause it's uh, 40 for first place in total and, uh, 20 for second place in total. So something like that is like probably doable once a month. Um, I'm not sure exactly, but it, it could be. Uh, so anyway, that's something to th keep in mind. Uh, definitely something that I feel like is cool is uh, if we can make that happen because it's it, it's a very small amount of money, uh, but it's a it's something right. It's a it's a thing. So uh, beyond that, uh, we obviously do have to think about um, when it comes to handling uh, other sorts of things like other details. Uh, we should probably get people to sign up as uh, subs so that we don't have to go hunting for people. It's like okay, uh, are you interested in playing? And if so, what groups are you available for? Uh, like I need, we, we, we want players who can be reserve. Um, you know, I, I organized this tournament pretty close to the actual playing time. I think it was like about a week out when I had people set their times and availabilities and still we had a lot of scheduling conflicts and that's sort of like, I'm not really sure what to make of that. Um, so, you know, like maybe certain people like Keen is notorious for, for not necessarily being available or, um, or whatever. And so like, you know, maybe that's just a side effect of that. Um, He's shown up to his his groups for his three tournaments that he's played in the groups, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure, man. So that's something to think about. Uh, but yeah, definitely something that I, I want to give it a shout uh, in general. Uh, so regardless, um, the end of end result of all of the invitational stuff is just that it's uh, it seemed like a really cool format, uh, the fact that it was groups only. I don't think that we'll end up doing anything with like the group winners uh, because fun like maybe some people could actually make it to the like a Sunday group uh, or a Sunday like final or whatever. Um, maybe we won't. What we'll do is like we'll limit it to three groups in the future. That might be something that we think about doing because then we actually could conceivably do like, OK, we have a winner's group and the winner's group is like one group of, of all of the, of the first placers of the other groups, right? A group made up of the first placers. And maybe we could do that. Like, I don't know the next day or something. Um, but I don't know, like it depends on availability. Uh, usually people can only sign up for one or two groups. Some people can sign up for all of them. Uh, but if that availability were the same thing going into the, the, like the Sunday, if we do this on a Saturday, then the Sunday would be a bit awkward, right? Cause it's like, eh, I'm not really a huge fan of that. Um, I also have to work on Sunday, so I can't do later times anyway. So yeah, it's just more stuff like logistic stuff to think about. But it would be cool. Like it would definitely be cool to do stuff that beyond the first day where it's just groups because it would help you. I we're used to the playoffs from the Ascension tournaments, and it's like, what are we gonna do if you know we have all these group winners? But like, then what? What happens, right? So I feel like that's something to think about in the future. Um, maybe there can be some way to like decide who actually won the tournament. Um, because right now it's like first to fourth, right? It's like, okay, but like, surely you could say, make a, you know, have some competition where it's like Lucy versus, you know, I don't know, like Lucy versus Balathal and, um, three crow versus, uh, mask and stuff like that. Like you have the, that as like a playoff bracket where it's just semifinals into a grand final. I don't know. Like surely you could do something like that. Uh, where it's single elimination, it's like nice and easy, but we'd have to find a time where all of those players are available for, you know, all of those times in general. So uh, that's something that would be cool to do, uh, but we have to figure out when people can do that. Uh, and most people can't, like there's gonna be some people who can only make like the, the noon group, like the earliest time, uh, and then they can't make like a follow-up in the same day. So they wouldn't be able to play like later that evening or something. Um, 
that same day. And then if we can't do it the same day, then we have to do it another day, which adds more time and that adds more scheduling and that adds more like annoyance and all this other stuff. And then it becomes like, we go back to that problem, right? Where it's like, well, we, I felt like we were really focusing on a lot of tournaments and that was getting in the way of other content development and just other things I wanted to do. Like I wanted to do more supercut videos. I wanted to do more uh, videos that were like not strictly related to Cosmonarchy Brood War and just in general I wanted to do more work that might not have been strictly related to Cosmonarchy Brood War but the other work related to CMBW the actual like work on content and work on polish and stuff couldn't get done because I was focusing so much of that like all of the CMBW dev energy was going towards the tournaments pretty much and tournament adjacent things so then Whenever I had other time, I wasn't thinking, what can I do that's not related to CMBW? I was thinking, what about CMBW can I work on that isn't related to the tournaments? So all of my time was being put into CMBW at that point. And uh, I don't think that it's like a question of burnout. It's just a question of like, I want to make sure that we're still making moving the dial on other details, right? So anyway, those are just some thoughts that I have. But uh, definitely something to, to keep in mind and uh, something that I am eager to... Uh, continue trying to, to move the needle on in a, like basically this is a question of time management. Uh, if other people want to work on running a tournament uh, or something, uh, that's totally fine by me, by the way, like obviously. Um, maybe I can even like help people get set up if they're gonna do that uh, and, and like help them figure out like, you know, like here's my OBS settings and here's my scene and here's my, um, you know, Photoshop files that I use and like, you can go nuts, like customize these to whatever degree and figure it out. Right. And, uh, and that's fine. Uh, but definitely I'm, I'm not hundred percent sure. Uh, but I, I feel like overall, um, we probably will just see a reduction in focus on tournaments. Like I'm, I'm thinking, you know, we'll have like two days out of the week or uh, sorry, two days out of the month that are these invitationals. Um, like, or, so like every other month, we'll have a month that has two invitationals and those are one day events and that's it. And then uh, the in-between months, right? So it's like if, if January and March and so on, like starting on January, every other month we'll have the invitationals. Then starting in February, uh, every other month would have the mainline tournaments, right? And then those tournaments are basically like the gauntlet into the group stage, into the playoffs, which is kind of like the whole month, honestly. So it might even be less than every once in a month. Maybe that's like four times a year or something, right? So I don't know. I have to think about that. Um, uh, but it's definitely something that I'm thinking about as like that a schedule that's more sane that would allow us to mm, provide more other work and other content that isn't strictly related to tournament stuff that still moves the needle for the project and makes it more complete and, more, and better. Um, I feel like that's uh, long overdue. So figuring out a, a balance of time and, and and all that stuff is definitely a big deal. And it's hard to do when you're uh, solo. Uh, and it's, there's, I mean, I'm not solo in the sense that like there's other people who help, like obviously Mess Casts and Veek helps with the tech and, you know, DF helps with the tech and, and art and Solstice helps with the art and Balithal helps with the art and uh, Enos is doing music and stuff like that. So there's definitely people who are contributing and it's definitely very much appreciated. But when it comes to, the tournament ops, I am pretty much on my own. It depends as working on some website stuff that'll make my life easier. So that is definitely gonna help when it's operational. Uh, but uh, I'll let him talk about that and announce that at some point later on. But definitely like, I just want more free time to work on things that are unrelated to the tournaments. And it definitely felt like I couldn't really do that towards the tail end of 2023. So that is something to fix for 2024. So wrapping things up here, we're going to be moving into the coffee questions. And I personally am a huge fan of the coffee questions. I just want to say that if you have supported financially, even if you're not supporting uh, as much anymore or any more, I think we have, I don't think anybody has stopped supporting. <laughs> uh, so, uh, but yeah, like if you're, if, so if you are supporting anyway, and you have supported, I really appreciate it. Uh, especially thinking about it in the current state where we have like, record uh, inflation and all this stuff in America and presumably around the world. Uh, I do appreciate that people still find the ability to uh, send some some dollary dues my way. I was just talking about how it's hard to do a lot of this stuff when you're solo doing the tournament ops and stuff. But one of the other points that I wanted to make there was that it's like, you know, I am putting in more than full time hours on this. Uh, and obviously I don't make a lot of money on it. You know, I don't have, uh, we don't have like an absurd amount of people on the coffee, uh, but I really do appreciate every little bit because you notice it, you know, you, when, when I look at the PayPal account and it, I'm like thinking, oh shit, 
you know, my phone bill is 50 bucks and I got to pay that. And I look at the PayPal account and like, maybe there's that much money in there. I actually haven't, I do, I am in that situation. I actually haven't looked at the PayPal account yet, but like stuff like that. Anyway, it, it helps. Uh, it's like a nice little, uh, release valve because, uh, I don't really want to do, to do, you know, gig work or, um, the part-time stuff that I'm doing like more than I am doing. I, I, I'd actually prefer to do it a little bit less, um, because obviously I want to have so much energy and so much time and so much focus on Cosmonarchy Brood War, on the RTS work that I'm doing, on the videos that I'm making, and all this other stuff. I, I, I want these creative ventures to uh, be self-sustaining in that sense, uh, but I re I'm not going to take, like, you know, weird sponsorship shit, and I'm not going to, you know, pimp out the content ridiculously uh, to look for that sort of thing. So anyway, it's nice to know that, like, right now, I do have that financial backing uh, and I appreciate it, especially now because I actually need it as opposed to like before it was just like, oh, it was nice on top. But now it's like, no, actually, you know, the way things are going, uh, economically speaking, it's a, it's a little bit dire. So for now, it's uh, it's essential. Uh, but in general, you know, I do appreciate it. And I guess I should also mention because I have a really bad sort of um, – uh, clarification anxiety when it comes to anything related to finances and asking for money and stuff. Uh, when I say it's essential, I mean, right now it's proving to be very useful. Uh, but if somebody stopped sending money, I wouldn't just like be on the street, obviously. So I just like, I'll be okay. Even if all the money goes away, I'll figure out a way to do it. Uh, so it's not like, yeah, I don't want anybody to feel like it's, um, feel, um, feel manipulated towards that for the purposes of like, you know, Oh, he's going to starve if I don't give no, dude, I'll, I'll be fine. I'll figure it out. Uh, but uh, for now, it's very useful and very appreciated. And that's the main message that I wanted to get across. Okay, let's talk about these questions. So Luciferius's question is, what would it take for you to do an Ascension Supercuts video? And I guess the answer is really just time, right? It's uh, I love the idea. I didn't even really think about it. I thought about it in the sense of hype. Like if I should basically go back and like maybe what I would do for the the hype video of uh, the eighth tournament, which isn't going to be called Ascension anymore, uh, the first proper tournament of uh, round uh, two of, of year two of uh, CMBW tournaments, season two, essentially. Um, that would be interesting to me is like, well, basically, if we can do something like uh, a sort of recap where it's like we go from we, we we go through all the hype casting moments where I'm like you know I'm shouting about something and Mesca's shouting about something and like we have that sort of like fading in and there's like some tension music in the background and stuff like that and uh, all that shit could be really cool right um, so if we can go through all of that then it would be really nice to uh, to use that as like the backdrop, uh, even if it's just like a, a quick montage of like 30 seconds to like s sift through all the different hype moments uh, of the last year. Uh, so like I've been thinking about it from that perspective, but when it comes to like a supercuts, usually it's like funny stuff um, is the, the supercut stuff. So I'm not sure if that's what Lucy was thinking, but that's like what I think of it when, it, you know, the, the previous supercuts are just like, what are some funny moments? Uh, or, you know, sometimes they can be like interesting or like, you know, there's like, commentary that's like fairly articulate and stuff um but yeah like beyond that it's just i'm not sure uh if it would be i, I wouldn't want people to think that i'm being uh like disrespectful when i supercut their game and it's just me laughing at them or something uh, but beyond that i feel like yeah it could be really it could be a lot of fun i feel like and people will figure it out you know like people will, will understand it's not a it's not like a slight against them. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's just a matter of time i guess is is my my thinking um maybe that's you know going back to what i said earlier when uh, we have like the coffee supporters and stuff, like maybe of a certain tier or whatever, uh, you can vote on content. Um, and so like I would make a list of things and maybe that would, maybe the Ascension Supercuts would make the list. Like, cause I think it'll be most useful for figuring out like a video, like what, what video should I make next kind of thing. Um, since obviously I know what I'm working on when it comes to like CMBW and I know what I'm working on when it comes to like tournament stuff and, and content and, and all this other stuff. But like when it comes to like making a video, like, do you guys want to see, you know, um, like what, what do you want me to focus on? And, and these could be like unrelated to CMBW per se. Like maybe, maybe it is, I mean, the Ascension Supercuts is technically related, but it might be like general channel stuff, right? It's like maybe, maybe specifically there could be a supercut poll and the supercut would be like, what should I supercut next? And it would be like a Starcraft custom campaign playthrough, uh, a game playthrough, uh, some other custom campaign playthrough, like a Warcraft one. Um, uh, and then like a, uh, like the Ascension stuff, right? And so like maybe that would be the thing and people could vote between them. Uh, stuff like that could be interesting, right? Um, so at any rate, uh, 
yeah, I guess that that answers the question. It's a good idea. Thank you for the idea, and thank you for the question. Thank you for the support. Biddy B's question is up next. He says, what other sorts of tournament formats are you hoping to run? Well, I was talking a little bit about the invitational stuff and like possible ideas for the, the exit uh, when it comes to the, like if you were hypothetically going to have multi, a multi-day event, but it's like group stage into single and playoffs or something. But I think he's getting at something that's like completely different than that. He wants something, he wants an answer presumably that is, uh, you know, something unrelated, right? Tournament formats, hoping to run. Uh, I guess I would say... I'm really interested in, um, I had this idea that it would basically, it would basically be like group stage, um, hmm. Like instead of using playoffs as the method, it would use group stage as the method. And what, what by that I mean, uh, I had the concept that, and this doesn't really work in the context of a four group tournament. So imagine you have a three group tournament and the first group is for like initial seating. So the first round rather of group play, uh, that's just like your three groups, right? Now then, if you're in third place, um, the third placers uh, fall into a group uh, where they duel amongst themselves, right? And the, um, the, the guy who wins that group would move on and the other two would be eliminated, I think is how this would work. Maybe the top two would move on, but to different seeds and the third player would be eliminated. Uh, anyway, uh, the second round would have that for the third placers. For the first placers, they would play, and the winner would go to like the finals group, and the second placer would go to the upper group, and the third placer would go to the lower group. And then, the, that, that, so that would be for the round three, right? And then the round two for the second placers of the original group, this is getting really complicated. Um, it's really hard to visualize this on any software as well. Uh, but basically it's like, if you're first place in your group, in your initial group on round one, then your second round is a group of other winners. If you're second place, then your second round is a group of other second placers. And if you're third place, your group is a group of other third placers, right? Now, if you if you're a, you win the winner's group, which is the second round for winners, right? Second round for first placers. Um, then you go to the finals group and you just wait for the rest of the tournament. Uh, losing the thir third place in the winner's group puts you in the lower group. Or sorry, the lower the lower bracket, I guess, and the uh, upper bracket, uh, which is is where the second placer goes, and so that's so that's round one or and two uh, for the winners. Now round two for the second placers is this is a group made out of people who were second place in their initial group, and those guys duke it out. First place will go to the upper, second place will go to the lower, and uh, third place will go to the oh what would we do with the third place? Maybe the third place here is also eliminated. That's the hard part that I'm thinking. Maybe maybe what what it is is first and second place in the second place round two goes to the upper bracket, and the third place goes to the lower bracket. And then in the third, so the the um the the group losers, the opening losers, the guys who were third place in the very first group, their second round, third place is eliminated, and the top two will go to the uh, lower group. So then. Your upper group would be uh, loser of the winner's group and first and second of the second place group. And that would be three players and they'd play a group. And then your third, your, your, uh, your lower group, your lower bracket group would be the first and second of the loser's group and your loser of the, the second place group. So the third place of the second place group. So Again, without visualizing this, this is just a mess to try to hold in your head if you're not me. So I, I don't think I'm doing a, a stellar job of, of communicating the info. But that's sort of what I was thinking, is that we would basically use groups to decide who goes where. And like that's how you advance, is you just play a series of groups. Um, and I don't know what happens after you reach that third round. Because round three, I guess the winner of that group goes to the upper that goes to the finals group they've qualified to the finals group right the um, so if you're in the if you're in the upper group which is uh you know first uh, last place of the winners group and first and second place of the second place group the winner of that goes to the finals and then I guess the other two move out uh, and then for the lower group the bottom two are eliminated and the top one goes to the uh final like the decider group right which is sort of like the the consolidation group. It's like the, the, the second to last group that gets played. 
And the winner of that group wins and does, and goes into the finals, and the bottom two are eliminated there as well. Um, but I, the, the awkward thing about a group where only the first place advances and the second and third place both drop out is that you can get a dead group pretty fast, where if somebody wins 4-0, right, then they've already won the group, and then the other games don't really need to be played. You would still want to play those games for seeding in case somebody can't make it to the next stage, then we know who was the better player in that group for second place to pull in as a replacement. But that's a really lame... The people probably might not try as hard, basically. That would be my concern. Uh, and it might not be as as uh, sensational. But it's still a valid way. So anyway, I think that kind of thing could be an interesting spectacle is literally like a group... like Because how many groups would that be? That'd be the, the initial group... The initial group stage, which is three groups, right? And then you have um, winners. So you have three more groups of like winners, second placers, losers. And then you have the, the third round is two groups. And the fourth round is one group, right? Because there's the upper group and the lower group. And then there's the final, the, the penultimate group and then the final group. So yeah, you'd have upper, lower, penultimate. So that's 10 groups overall with the finals group. That's pretty cool. I mean, it's literally a 10 group tournament. I don't know about it. I feel like it would be pretty chaotic and, and stuff, but it could be cool. So I'll throw that out there um, to think of other tournament formats off the top of my head, I think is uh, a bit much, but uh, that's that's what comes to mind is like a tournament that's literally made of groups. And I think I made it work, but again, that's all in my head. I'd have to actually plug it in. And uh, yeah, and good luck explaining that, obviously. So hopefully that un that was, you, you understood that. The, the key takeaways are just that you need to have 10 groups. So that's a lot. Thanks for your question and for your support, homie. Let's move on to Three Crows' question. He asks, what is your roadmap wish list for 2024? And then later on he adds, um, mine is iScript extender, tutorial content, and campaign content. Um, well, obviously, uh, the iScript extender is pretty high on the list of priorities. Uh, it's something that I've wanted for a very long time, and it's something that we actually need to finish the races anyway. I mean, technically it might not be true, but if I also want like factional units and stuff, then I kind of have to, right? Um, like, I could see a world where we downsize the project and think, okay, we're not going to do the Escozi after all, and we're not going to do the iScript extender after all, and instead we're just going to leave it as it is, and we're we're going to cut all the faction shit entirely and just ditch it and, and then, you know, go towards um, finishing the, the races for Melee and then just sort of leave it, and, and that's it. But I think it's fine to do what we're doing. It's just going to cost more. It's going to take more time, right? So the iScript extender is definitely a big deal. Um, as far as like a roadmap goes, I'm not sure if it's like the first thing that we're going to do because it's not like mission critical for things like the next tournament or things like even the, uh, into the tutorial content, right? The tutorial campaign content, you don't need the iScript extender for, you don't even need factions for, cause it's like melee tech tree to be, keep it as simple as possible. Um, so then when we're thinking about it from the perspective of the, yeah, so we're, we're thinking about it from the roadmap, right? It's like, here's a situation where, like, what is, the, what is the first order of business? I actually think I would swap the tutorial with the iScript extender. I think the, the tutorial content is the first order of business, plus, like, video content that helps, like, break people into the, the project. And then uh, if we move from there into uh, the uh, work that we can do on, what do you call it? We go from tutorial content into uh, and, and video content, right? That that's like phase one or whatever. Phase two can be the iScript extender for sure because we would want that for more factional stuff. Uh, and then I don't know, but like also I think I would work on campaign content at the same time. It really depends on how long it would take the iScript extender. Uh, but I guess you can say like iScript extender would be second, and then we would do like tech tree finalizations for the existing races plus factional additions plus campaign content that would all be like a phase three and then a phase four would be working on the um uh like the escozi race obviously and uh i guess there would probably like phase five would just be more campaign content i guess that's probably what i would say i think we can get through we can start phase four in that sort of environment right where it's uh so phase one, again, is is the initial tutorial bout and uh, the videos and stuff that like help people get into CMBW. And then phase two would be Ice Code Extender. Phase three would be um, 
I guess you can also like say iScript extender and like a bunch of UI updates, right? Um, and then phase two, or uh, sorry, phase three would be the, the campaign focus for like the existing races, right? And then phase four would be Escozy. I think we can start phase four, which is the Escozy stuff, um, which means we've done the other stuff, right? Like gone through all the other stuff. We can probably start that before halfway through the year, like around June would be like the cutoff point, I would think, for when we start. Like by June, we should be like starting on the Escozy already, right? Um, I think that would be pretty sensible. I think that's like a, a safe assumption, but there's still some ambiguity. Like we don't really know what the final thing is gonna look like when we're done with the iScript extender. Um, so like, we don't really know what, what's left to do with that. Um, you know, there's certain details like the uh, Nexus power field that we've wanted to add for a while. It's like, okay, well that might actually prove to be really challenging for whatever reason. Uh, the UI stuff is gonna be a lot of reverse engineering. That might prove to be more challenging than we, we predict. And so maybe certain UI features will still be not, like it'll still be missing halfway through the year or something. I hope not, but that could be a thing, right? Uh, the Nexus power field might not even be able to be implemented. I certainly hope not, because it would be really nice to have, but that's a thing, right? That's a possibility. So, you know, I'm 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 of uh, half of mine to add like a turret, a subunit to the Nexus, and that subunit be the the power field, and uh, and just deal with the fact that it's like jank internally, but hopefully it doesn't like cause any significant headaches or whatever. Um, I think that would be fine personally. I don't think that that would be a big deal. Uh, so maybe that can be like a, a maybe that's even like a placeholder until we figure out like what's causing the the issue, or or maybe that's fine as like a. Uh, a jank like thing initially or something. Um, I don't know. It seems like a fine idea to me, uh, but th th that's just something that occurred to me is like, can I do it in a, in a, in a jank, stupid brood war way and still have it be functional? Like, yeah, maybe that's it. Right. Like the Goliath turret basically, but like, instead of turning and shooting, it just sits there and provides power. <laughs> that would probably be fine, honestly. So um, anyway, that is something to think about. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a pretty good roadmap. Uh, hopefully that gave you some ideas. Um, I guess like I can get uh, I can go into a slightly heavier amount of detail and just say that like the first campaign that I really want to make is probably uh, Day of Blood because Day of Blood is um, it's a short campaign but it has faction stuff associated with it and it's it's Terran versus Terran but then there's like Zerg involvement and stuff it's it's I think it's it's very classical like it doesn't involve Protoss and it doesn't and it's not it, it, you wouldn't even really be able to retrofit it to involve a Scozy either. So it's not even like obviously it was made before the Scozy were thought of as like a fourth race uh, for CMBW, but I wouldn't imagine putting it in there, you know. Uh, so anyway, that's something to think about. Uh, but yeah, anyway, that's that's something that I should point out. Anyway, is like I feel like it'll be an exciting time, uh, uh, and and Day of Blood would be like the first campaign to focus on. After that. Probably to touch the sun because it is the tutorial campaign. Uh, and then following that, we would think about like a Zerg campaign or a Protoss campaign or something. Uh, because to touch the sun has like all of the races. Well, it has like, the, the three OG races. It doesn't have a Scozy, um, which is kind of funny. Uh, but, you know, that's fine. Uh, maybe I, I might revise it to be more of like... I, I might revise it, to, revise it to not involve you controlling Protoss. Um I'm not sure yet, but I'm pretty sure it'll it'll be fine as it is. Like I I don't think it's a big that big of a deal, but um, okay. Anyway, I've gone through that list. Uh, I think he, obviously we would want a campaign for each race minimum, uh, and then a camp that it would include the Escozi, obviously, and then we'd have to see what happens from there. But uh, that's something to think about. All right, let's uh, move on. Thank you, Three Crow, for your question. The Shambler asks, what gods and holidays do the Macroldos worship and celebrate? So it's interesting because the Macroldos are very much not a celebratory culture. You can kind of say that the Dasir are obviously like they, they might have been um, persuaded, uh, convinced that the Macrolon are gods or godlike entities. Um, they don't have holidays, though. Uh, they definitely don't have like... They're not that organized or intelligent, really, right? The Dossier. The Macrolon, however, are obviously... They're very, like, self-aggrandizing creatures in some ways. Um, so you can think of, like, you know, like the birthday or whatever of the... Uh, like, uh, it's not even really the birthday, but, like, the celebrate. Yeah, I guess it would be a commencement day, wouldn't it? Because I haven't thought about, like, holidays per se. I've thought about religion, uh, but the Macrolas don't really have that. But they, so the empire, like all of the holidays and stuff would always be localized, right? Um, it's like, you don't have like a holiday for the entire species. 
Um, so, you know, like that kind of works. It doesn't really work, but it kind of works where like a lot of countries around the world here in America, in, in America, in, in the planet Earth. Yeah, the whole planet is America. Um, so on, on Earth, right, the human society that we've got holidays that stretch across the world, but not everybody celebrates them. Uh, there's a bunch of uncontacted tribes and stuff that don't celebrate them, obviously, uh, as an example. But like there's more mundane examples than that. Um, so it would be like, well, a national holiday or it would be a, you know, a holiday that's based on your religion or your um, some other aspect of you that links you. Uh, to like a culture that has this holiday. And so uh, that would be something to think about. And I think as a result, the only thing that really comes to mind for Makro Das is probably the com the day of commencement for their emperor. That would be a, a, a day of, or maybe like the day after. It's either the day before, the day of, or the day after. It's like it, what, maybe that, that, that trifecta um, would be something to think about. Uh, and, and that would be an obvious thing where it's like, I don't know if it would be a hol it might be the opposite of a holiday where they work harder that day <laughs> or something, but I, I have to think about what, what would make the most sense. <clears throat> but uh, also, you know, like it's hard to think about holidays from a logistic standpoint because it's like, I guess it's not that hard. It's just their calendars are going to be all different. So that's another reason why it would be almost arbitrary. If your emperor, if your empire stretches beyond one um, star system or even one planet, that's it's, it starts to become logistically very difficult to synchronize. Um, but I guess it wouldn't be that hard in some ways because you would just say like we're receiving the the missive from the seat of power that says you know like the the the, the crown dictates that you know adjusted for our standard time. Uh, in one day we will be doing it or in one week or whatever. And so like stuff like that, you could do that. So I guess that's possible. So yeah, that, that, that's, that's your holiday. I don't know what it would be like exactly. I have a feeling, um, it would definitely be a day off for the macro macrolon. I'm not sure if it would be a day off for the dossier. Probably not. But, uh, you know, it, it might be like a day of, uh, contemplation, uh, and, and, uh, thinking about like a day of planning perhaps, like a day where they spend time thinking about their own personal aspiration and a path to the, the to the throne, right? So that could be interesting. Also, the amount of times where somebody tries to uh, execute the given emperor, they try a coup um, on that day would be pretty high. So there'd be like tensions running high on the throne world. So that, that would be interesting. So there you go. So... We're moving on from that. Thank you, Shambler, for your question. And we come to the final question of the show. It's Mirian who asks, what is the society of the Delventhos like? So the Delventhos are a society, a species that has turned inward after making a massive amount of technological gains and uh, creating some very interesting technological uh, achievements and, and engineering. Uh, they're the guys who um, migrate through the solar system using essentially like, uh, like, planetary slingshot systems and stuff. They don't have spacecraft conventionally. Uh, they they use that sl the slingshot system. Um, and then like in order to, on, on lo like logistics, they kind of use like catapults, but like um, man cannons, I guess. It's, it's like uh, the idea of launching across the battlefield um, to, and they have like some safe way for their, you know, their units to not take damage um, upon landing. And they have like orbital reentry and stuff, so that's sort of their method, where they they rely almost on like instead of spacecraft, they have like missiles. Uh, you can kind of think of them as that. So that's that's it's a very different methodology, right? Um, now the Dalvento Society uh, has turned inward, and so they mostly exist as digital consciousnesses, and those digital consciousnesses will manifest on the battlefield in you know controlling uh, essentially like remote rem remote piloting. Um, certain things, right? And so they have this council of elders that remains, uh, it, it's ambiguous as to whether or not they remain organic or if their consciousnesses simply remain active all the time because often they're in hibernation. Um, like the average Daventhos is in hibernation. Um, and they have these, you know, uh, worlds that are essentially made up of uh, circuitry. Uh, the, the circuit worlds that um, provide the 
storage necessary for all of the, you know, the Dalventos of a certain um, particular nation or whatever, or organization. So their society is essentially split up between, there's like a bunch of people who are veterans who are called upon uh, by the council and the council will call upon them for input on a, like, oh, you have experience leading armies uh, against this particular kind of threat. Uh, so we, we awaken you from stasis and ask you for your advice in this conflict that is currently, you know, we are beset upon by these people again, or we have detected that these people are moving into a nearby neighborhood. And so we must ward them off. You know, we, we require your, um, your uh, intelligence and your sort of uh, perspective on this. And so you, the hierarchy is basically like you got the council and they monitor things and respond to threats uh, and they decide how heavy to escalate it. So do they spin up, you know, the veterans who may have different, you know, PTSD or whatever the fuck, like um, may have different things that weigh them down. Right. And so then you might want to say like, okay, well they know they've earned their respite. Um, <clears throat> It's like the, the, the way that the Devanthos consciousness works, especially being fragmented out the way that it is by uh, piloting and remote piloting and experiencing horrors of war firsthand, but like across many instances. It's not just like they've lived many lives of sudden warfare death. Um, and, and it can be very, uh, you know, something that can be very debilitating over enough time. And so the longer, the more somebody has served and the more, oper more times they've served and the more times they've been spun up out of their hibernation, out of their slumber, <clears throat> it's... um. The, the more times you get that sort of thing, the obviously like the, the more challenging it will be for them to remain level headed in some ways. Um, like they'll be cool in some respects, they'll be experienced, but internally they will be suffering. And so they, the, the council has to kind of balance that. So they essentially decide like, is this threat, you know, big enough to warrant some of the people who are sort of like the, the final bosses of um, Del Ventos leadership fighting against this threat. Like, no, those guys have definitely earned their rest and then some. Let's let's go for somebody who's you know only fought one or two engagements against these guys, but still has you know valid leadership skills in this area because it's not going to be that big of a deal. Whereas if it's like a world-ending threat, well, that's when they might spin up everybody or spin up a lot of the people that are specifically geared towards resolving this threat, and that's when the Delventhos leadership and the and, and stuff can get very difficult to fight against because they become much more powerful, right? But uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure if this gives Mirian enough info to ask more a more pointed question because the society part is pretty vague. But th yeah, the hierarchy is basically the the council of elders and then the uh, people who have all like the combat veterans, right? And the the leaders, the combat leaders and stuff, uh, the generals, whatever you want to call them. And then you know they're in their own personal simulations, otherwise, right? So um, it's a little bit difficult to say that they have much of a society at all because they are mostly living as digital creatures. Uh, so, you know, when, they, when they're deployed, um, you know, they, they, they exist digitally until their forms are, their combat forms are required to be deployed, right? So, like, even then, it's, uh, they're not in their own personal simulation. That's when they start getting into a shared simulation with the other Delventhine minds that are uh, the, the consciousnesses that have been spun up. But... Uh, even then, it's not much of a, I don't think it's much of a society. Um, it's more like a military barracks or something, you know, <laughs> so that sort of energy anyway. So hopefully that answered your question. And uh, yeah, thanks for all your support down the years, homie. Appreciate it. Here's to 2024. It's uh, definitely an exciting time to be a member of the No Frauds Club. And I am really looking forward to what this year has it has to offer, not just because I plan on doing some exciting new things when it comes to like those long form video essays that I mentioned and maybe some of the, the wacky tournaments ideas and uh, the, the new videos and new content that's going to be made. But in general, I think, you know, we're just going to continue refining our skills as, as a designer and, of course, um, working on this really cool project that we've that has now been been being worked on for a very long time. Right. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing what people have to say about it. Uh, by the end of things and how many more people that we have sort of crow pilled, I guess. Um, it, it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting. So there you go. That is it for this episode of Prototype. I'll see you guys later.